Welcome to the virtual tour of the Reykjavik Research Library at the Corning Museum of Glass. The Reykjavik Special Collections and Archives are home to the world's most comprehensive collection of materials on glass. I'm Joe Schill, archivist at the Reykjavik. And I'm Sarah Allender, project archivist. The Corning Museum of Glass was founded by Corning Glass Works, now Corning Incorporated, in 1951 as a nonprofit educational institution. Today's library and the museum still share a campus with several Corning Incorporated buildings. However, Corning Incorporated maintains its own corporate archive, which is separate from the Reykjavik Library archives, while the Corning Incorporated Department of Archives and Records Management focuses on the history of the company and its products. The Reykjavik Library Archive has a broader focus on the history and art of glass and glassmaking. The museum supports several publications, such as the Journal of Glass Studies and New Glass Review. It also provides several funding opportunities for researchers to study glass, including the Reykjavik Grant for Glass Research and the David Whitehouse Research Residency for Scholars. Additionally, glassmaking students from the studio at the Corning Museum of Glass frequently conduct research at the Reykjavik. This year, the Corning Museum of Glass is celebrating a significant anniversary along with Merak. 2022 is the 50th anniversary of Hurricane Agnes and the devastating flood that impacted our area, dropping 22 inches of rain on the region in just one day. The Chemung River flooded downtown Corning, inundating both the museum and the library with 5 feet 4 inches of water. At the time, the museum's director, Thomas Beekner, described the flood as possibly the greatest single catastrophe borne by an American museum. As a result of the flood, half of the library's collections were damaged by floodwaters and mud. Thousands of rare volumes needed to be dried, cleaned, and restored. It took two years for staff, volunteers, and conservators to complete the work, and four years to fully restore the museum's glass collection. Despite the years of work ahead of them, museum staff reopened to the public in August of 1972, just six weeks after the flood. One of the unique challenges we still face here is the damage to the archival materials, many of which were severely damaged by flood mud and still display the after effects today, including mud residue and extensive mold growth. In 1977, the library was expanded and raised above flood level. In 1984, it was named the Juliet K. and Leonard S. Reykjavik Research Library in honor of the Reykjavik who were prominent glass collectors, researchers, and benefactors of both the Corning Museum of Glass and its library. Although the library was originally part of the museum building, collections eventually grew so much that off-site storage became necessary. The library was relocated several times before the new Reykjavik Library, shown here, opened in 2000. The library contains over 500,000 print items, including 75,000 volumes in over 50 languages, thousands of design drawings and photographs, trade catalogs, periodicals, and more than 300,000 digital files. The archives include more than 200 manuscript collections, totaling approximately 6,000 linear feet. The oldest item in the library is the Mappa Clavicula, a 12th century Latin manuscript described as a chemistry book for the medieval artist. It contains over 200 recipes for making colors and metallic effects, such as gold, silver, and copper for painting, writing, and ornamentation. The most popular research topic for researchers at the Reykjavik, according to our reference librarians, is Pyrex. For this virtual tour, we took our inspiration from the museum's vision statement to be the international leader in transforming the world's understanding of the art, history, and science of glass. So today, we'd like to show you some highlights from several collections that showcase these three aspects of the world of glass, beginning with its history. The Rotifer Glass Company records consist of the business records of an American glass manufacturer located in Bel Air, Ohio. It contains a variety of materials, including financial records, production record books, photographs, and more. First, we have an accounting ledger dating from 1899 to 1903, and a production record book from 1900 that includes the names of workers in the glass factory and their weekly pay. 
Next is the production record book from the company's silvering room, where employees would coat glass with silver to make it reflective. Many of the employees who worked in Rotifer's silvering room were women, which was common in the industry at the time. And finally, we have glass plate negatives of the exterior of the Rotifer factory and an interior display of Rotifer glass. This collection, the Jay and Mickey Doros collection of American glass manufacturing ephemera, contains an assortment of objects assembled by collectors Jay and Mickey Doros. One of the most unusual things in this collection is the glass house money, also called scrip, shown here. These were the wages paid to workers at glass houses that they could only use in the company store, a practice that was common in coal mining and other industries, including glass making. Following this, we have stock certificates, receipts, and purchase orders from several 19th and 20th century glass manufacturers. The T.G. Hawks Company was a glass cutting firm in Corning, New York, owned by three generations of the Hawks family. Some highlights include design drawings and silhouettes, employment and legal records, and advertisements for catalogs. This collection is a good example of the type of materials researchers can find in the Reichau's corporate records, most of which were created by American glassmaking firms in the 19th and 20th centuries. One of our most popular collections is the Leopold and Rudolf Blaschka collection of design drawings, which is a great example of the collections in the Reichau that explore science through the lens of glass. The Blaschkas were a father and son glassmaking team from Dresden, Germany, who created hundreds of botanical and marine invertebrate study models in the late 1800s and early 1900s, supplying museums and universities all over the world. Materials in this collection date from the mid 1800s to the 1920s and include over 900 drawings of marine invertebrates and botanicals the Blaschkas used to make their famously detailed glass models of undersea life, plants, and flowers. A well-known event in Corning history is the creation of the 200-inch glass disc for the HAL Observatory at Mount Palomar in 1934. Corning Glassworks began studying the feasibility of building such a large disc in 1931 and made a first attempt at casting the disc, which would serve as a telescope mirror, in March 1934. The first disc failed, but the second was a success. After a 10-month annealing, or cooling period, the disc was shipped by railroad to California in 1936. These two collections include photographs of all stages of the disc's creation, as well as correspondence to and from George Macaulay, the Corning physicist who was responsible for designing and casting the 200-inch disc. In December 2021, nearly 100 years after the creation of the 200-inch disc, engineers at Corning Inc.'s facility in Keene, New Hampshire, engineered and manufactured some of the optical instruments used for the James Webb Telescope, a space-based telescope that orbits the sun one million miles away from Earth and will be used to observe distant planets and galaxies, thus continuing the tradition of Corning's involvement in space exploration. The Dominic Labino papers are the personal papers of scientist and artist Dominic Labino. Labino was born in Clarion, Pennsylvania in 1910 and studied engineering at what is now Carnegie Mellon University. He worked for several glass manufacturing companies, including the bottle maker Owens, Illinois, and the fiberglass manufacturers Glass Fibers, Inc., which Labino co-founded, and Johns Manville. Labino developed the pure silica fibers that were used by NASA to make lightweight insulating tiles for the Apollo and Gemini spacecraft, as well as the shuttle Columbia. In this collection, some prominent objects include advertisements for Vitron, a type of glass fiber made by Glass Fibers, Inc., and an unidentified kit from the 1950s that may be a sales kit. It contains several kinds of glass products, including glass fiber cloths, glass insulation for wiring, a marble that can produce 97 miles of glass filament, and a piece of honeycomb core material composed of a glass and plastic resin that could support large amounts of weight and pressure and was used in radar equipment and airplanes. 
Labino's glass formulas and advice on furnace construction were instrumental in the success of Harvey Littleton's first glass workshop at the Toledo Museum of Art in 1962. Lubino's formula for number 475 fiberglass and expertise in building furnaces allowed artists to melt smaller batches of glass at lower temperatures in their own studios, leading to the birth of the studio glass movement. Lubino became a respected glass artist and blew glass at his studio in Grand Rapids, Ohio until his death in 1987. After the establishment of the studio glass movement, more artists began experimenting with making glass sculptures in an independent studio environment. Two of the most noted of these artists were Joel Philip Myers and Marvin Lepofsky, who were both pioneering members of the studio glass community from the 1960s onward. Both artists were known for their playful experimental forms, which you can see in these photographs of their work. The Lepofsky collection also includes posters and audiovisual recordings, many of which are home movies made from 1965 to 2016, and include a variety of glassblowing demonstrations captured on film. Another notable glass artist was Lucartha Kohler, who worked in glass casting and was a teacher and writer in addition to being a female glass artist at a time when there were few women in the field. Kohler's papers consist of exhibit announcements and flyers, correspondence with other women in the art world, and research files on female glass artists, many of whom were members of the studio glass movement. There are far more women working in glass art today which you can see for yourself if you watch some of the glass blowing demonstrations by guest artists and the hot glass team at the Corning Museum of Glass, if you watch the show Blown Away on Netflix, or if you explore the work of some of the museum's many female artists in residence who have continued the art of glass making while bringing it into the 21st century. We hope you enjoyed the tour and thank you for watching.